A good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining. So I, would I would like to share with you something on factorization theory in rings of integer variety. So part of, part of what I'm going to share was supported by the Austrian Science Fund, FWF, under my supervisor's grant. She's called Professor Sophie Frisch. And also for some months, I was supported by my institute this side, Institute of Analysis and Number Theory of Graz University of Technology. Okay, so we have a brief introduction. So by a ring will mean an empty state together with operations, visual additional multiplication, satisfying certain properties. For instance, our usual numbers are rings, the integers, the rationals, the reals, the complex numbers with additional multiplication, these are rings, but also if polynomials with coefficients from a ring also form a ring. Okay, so we know that every non-zero integer can be expressed uniquely as a product of prime numbers. So we say that in this ring of integers, we have uniqueness of factorizations into elements. Okay, this is not the case in an arbitrary ring. So there are some rings which do not have uniqueness of factorization into elements. For example, so in this ring, we have 14, it's two times seven, but 14 also has this other factorization. Okay, so this non-uniqueness of factorizations stems back to nine, the 19th century. So the failure of uniqueness of factorization into elements was discovered by 19th century mathematicians. And this was in the initial attempts to solve Fermat's last theorem. So the initial proofs wanted to use factorization in rings of integers of cyclotomic fields, but I think it was Kuma. So he already observed, he had already observed that these rings in general do not have unique factorization into elements. Okay, so it hindered the initial attempts to solve this theorem, but it gave birth to factorization theory. So in particular, factorization theory involves investigating phenomena related to non-uniqueness of factorizations in algebraic structures. And one of its goals is to characterize arithmetical and algebraic properties of algebraic structures in terms of factorization properties. Okay, so today we are focusing on factorization theory in rings of integer valued polynomials. Okay. So we shall get to know what int d is and also some factorization terms. Then we shall look at sets of lengths in int d. So sets of lengths, this is the most studied invariant in factorization theory. And from it, we get other invariants. Okay, then we shall finally look at absolute irreducibility. Okay, int d. So we have a domain d with quotient field k. So still just imagine integers with the rationals. Okay, so such a domain with quotient field K. So the ring of integer valued polynomials on D, which we denote by int D, consists of polynomials with coefficients from K, such that when you input an element of D, the output is in D. So in other words, there are special elements of Kx which map D to D. In particular, it's a subring of Kx. Okay, so it's a subring of Kx. So which elements of Kx are in int D? So let's have a remark. So remember, we can always write a polynomial with coefficients from K as a quotient G over B with G dx and B non-zero. Okay, and written in such a form, we have that F is in int D if and only if B divides the images G A for all A in D. So in other words, I want the image F of A to B in D. So B must divide the images G A for all A and D. So it follows from the definition. Okay, some examples. So DX trivially sits in int D, is in int D. I mean, when B is one or negative one, but you can have those outside DX. An example is this, this is an int C. So why is it in int C? Pick an or even integer, substitute it here. This will be even. And when you pick an odd, in x minus one, this will, be, will give us an even as, as well. So any integer you pick, the image is even, in particular divisible by two. So this is an int C. Okay, now this belongs to a special type of polynomials 
known to be in INSEC, we call them the binomial polynomials. So for each a n, x choose n is in INSEC. So more generally, number theory results give us elements of NC. For example, we know that a product of n consecutive integers is divisible by n factorial. So from that, we get other elements other than this. Okay, so now these binomial polynomials are very special in this ring of integer value polynomials. Why? Because every element of NC can be written as a Z, as a Z linear combination, yes. So as a Z linear combination of elements of, of binomial polynomials. I was trying to simplify it. In other words, the binomial polynomials form uh, a, a, a basis, a Z basis of NC. Okay. Now, like I said, int D is just a subring of Kx, so it's known to provide friendly counter examples. An example. Int Z is a friendly nanotherian ring. So it's one of those friendly examples of nanotherian rings. And more generally, for many days, int D is nanotherian. For example, more generally, any ring of integers of an of an a number field K with D, such int D are also nanotherian. Okay, I'll give a reference. Okay, but today we are focusing on the fact that int D in general is not a unique factorization domain. So in other words, it has the other failure of uniqueness of factorization into elements. An example. So in int C, this polynomial, this is an int C, it's just the other polynomial over two times an element of Px. So this is an int C and it factors into these two irreducibles and it also factors into these two irreducibles. So why is this irreducible? I mean, you can't split it into two. Whenever I try to split it, what you get is not an int C. Okay, so maybe let's look at the factorization terms. So let R be a commutative ring with identity. Still imagine the integers. So a non-zero element u in R is called a unit if there exists a b in R such that u b is one. So in other words, the units are the invertible elements. An example, the units of c are one and negative one. Okay, and actually these are the units of int c. Okay, so another definition is irreducible. So a non-zero non-unit R is said to be irreducible in R. If whenever R is a B, then either A or B is a unit. So we can't write R as a product of two non units. A quick example is our prime numbers. So the prime numbers are trivially irreducible in Z. Okay, so another definition is what we know a factorization. So a factorization of R is an expression of R as a product of irreducibles. Okay. And the number of irreducible factors in such a factorization is what we call the length of that factorization. Almost done with the definitions. So we say R is associated in R if there exists a unit U in R such that R is US. In other words, R and S differ by a unit and we shall denote it by that. R is associated to S. An example is two is associated to negative two in Z. Remember the units of um, the units of Z are one and negative one. So we see that two is already is associated to negative two. Yeah, I think this is the last one. So two factorizations of the same element, these two are called essentially the same. If they have contain the same number of irreducible factors, and after a suitable reindexing. A J is associated to B J. Otherwise, we call them essentially different. So, what does this mean? So, I can have two factorizations, and I can claim that they are different. But for us, in some cases, we consider them to be the same. An example is in this ring. So, eighty one is three those four copies, and it's also that. So, one can claim that these two are, factor are two factorizations of eighty one. But for us, they are essentially the same. Why? Because three and negative three are associated. In other words, the units here are just also actually one and negative one. But on the other hand, 
These are two essentially different factorizations of 81, clearly. This and that are two essentially different factorizations. Okay, now since we can have essentially different factorizations, moreover, in this case, we see that they are of different lengths. This is of length two, and this is of, what? This is of length four, four irreducible factors, and this is of length two. So since we can have essentially different ones, and they can be of different lengths, like in this case, we have the notion of set of lengths. So the set of lengths of an element R, which we denote by LR, is the set of all natural numbers N such that R has a factorization of length N. So in particular, it's just a collection of lengths of factorizations of R. An example is this. So we already saw this polynomial in MC. So this has length two, two irreducible factors. So this also has length two. So the set of factorize, the set of lengths of this particular element will be two, two. But for sets, we don't allow repetition. So our set of lengths will be just two. Okay, so like I said at the beginning, sets of lengths, and this is the most studied invariant, and from the, I'm sorry, from them we get other invariants. So in C, my supervisor decided, Professor Sophie Frisch, so she studied sets of lengths in int z. Let's see what she did. That was the main result in her, in her paper. That for natural numbers m1, mn, which should be greater than one, there exists a polynomial h in int z with exactly n essentially different factorizations of lengths, this m1, mn. So, what does this theorem say? It says that in int c, I can just pick any set as long as the numbers are greater than one, say two, three, three, five. Then I can construct a polynomial h in int c such that h factors into two irreducibles, another three irreducibles, different ones three, then another factorization of length five, and only this. So this is what this theorem says. And any set you think of, as long as the numbers are greater than one. Okay, so we said sets of lengths, we don't allow repetitions. So the set of lengths of this H, which has this behavior is two, three, five. So what does it mean? This result tells us that every finite subset of natural numbers greater than one is a set of lengths of an element of int C. Every finite subset, any set you pick, as long as the numbers are greater than one, you can find an element of int C which has that set as a set of lengths. So that's, this, that is what, so we are not actually talking about the cardinality in this case. I'm sorry, maybe if there is some confusion. So it's not a cardinality. Okay, so currently domains with this behavior are said to have full system of sets of lengths. So a domain D is said to have full system of sets of lengths if every finite subset of natural numbers greater than one is a set of lengths of an element of D. Okay, so now these are a few such domains, actually there are many monoids. So in C, like I said, it's very friendly. So when it joins this, this group or this list of the list of <clears throat> domains with this behavior or those which have full system of sets of lengths. So it was natural to ask, are there other domains here such that int D has full system of sets of lengths? Are there other domains this such that int D has full system of sets of lengths? We got a positive answer that if D is dedicated with infinitely many maximal ideals, all of them of finite index, then int D has full system of sets of lengths. How did we achieve this? Same story. So we proved that for such dedicated domains, any set you pick, as long as the numbers are greater than one, there is a polynomial H in int D with exactly in essentially different factorizations of these lengths. Now, 
These dedicated domains are our usual domains. Integers is among them. More generally, any ring of integers of a number field K is among these dedicated domains. So still it's a friendly theorem. Okay, now the tools we use are exactly the same as, are similar, not exactly the same. So they are similar to the tools Professor Frisch used in her original construction, and they heavily depend on the base ring D. So in her construction, she uses what she, she utilizes most is elements in two prime numbers in Z. Then it, the fact that also D, Z has infinitely many prime ideals and all of them are of finite index. In this case, index I'm referring to the cardinality of D mod P. Okay, so what we use here is we are utilizing the unique factorization of ideals in two prime ideals in dedicated domains. So that is one of the characterization of dedicated domains. They have unique factorization of ideals into prime ideals. So in other words, we migrated, we use similar tools, but we migrated from elements to ideals. Okay, and they, the key ingredients are Chinese remainder theorem and also Azerstein irreducibility criterion. Okay. Now, like I said, this theorem says, I can pick maybe three, three, five, then I can find a polynomial HNHD, which factors like that. So our proofs are constructive and these factorizations are square free. In other words, the HIs here are distinct. We can't have H1 squared. Why? Because actually it's a very careful choice. Why? Because H, you can have a, an irreducible H1, you square it, you expect it to be H1 times H1, but it ends up giving you a completely different factorization. So that is the behavior we are looking at next. Absolute irreducibility. Okay. So we need a definition. So an irreducible element R is called absolutely irreducible. If for all natural numbers n, every finite, every factorization of r to power n is essentially the same as n copies of r. So, I mean, this is the expected behavior. I mean, I have an irreducible element. When I raise it to any power, I expect it to give me just those n copies of that irreducible. For example, our prime elements are very nice. They are always nice. Okay. On the other hand, if R is irreducible, but there exists a natural number n greater than one, such that R to power n has other factorizations essentially different from n copies of R, then R is called non-absolutely irreducible. Okay, so this is the expected behavior. This is the surprising behavior. So we look at examples of the non-expected one, okay. So in this ring, seven is irreducible. So seven squared is expected to be seven times seven, but instead it gives us another factorization. So it's also this times that, and more happens. In this ring, three is irreducible and three to power four is expected to be four copies of three, but now it shrinks to even two factors. Okay, now Professor Chapman and Professor Krause prove that every irreducible element of a ring of integers of a number field K, these are examples of rings of integers. So every irreducible element of OK is absolutely irreducible if and only if OK is a unique factorization domain. So in other words, in other words, if I have a ring of integers of a number field K and it has the other failure of uniqueness of factorizations in two elements, I will always expect this behavior, these irreducibles of this type. So likewise, like I said, our integer value polynomials have the failure of uniqueness of factorization. And they are among those which also have this behavior. Okay, so let's look at an example in NC. 
So in NC, we have this element. This is irreducible. This is covering the odd integers. X squared plus three is covering the odd integers alone. So whenever I try to factor, X squared will be needed. X squared plus three will be needed. So this is irreducible. Okay, so F squared is that, but it also has this other factorization. Now, what is happening is X and X minus four are in this polynomial. They are playing the same role. They are covering the even numbers or the zero residue class, let's say. So they're covering the even numbers, but they are both needed because of this square in the denominator. And at once I square one, I can do away with the other. And we call this behavior interchangeability. They are playing the same role. Once I square, I can do away with the other. So there are several constructions, general constructions of non-absolutely irreducibles in in C. In that paper, I'll show the reference. Okay, a quick remark. Now, this concept of absolute irreducibility, or absolutely irreducible elements, were first used to characterize number fields with certain class groups. So it started in 19, 1991. And another thing to note is that their absence, the absence of absolutely irreducible elements give, gives information on the prime ideal structure of the ring. How? If I have a ring, it does not have absolutely irreducible elements. It already tells me it does not have prime elements. And the bonus is it cannot have principal prime ideals. Okay. So like I said, absolutely irreducibles are the nice ones, but the non-absolutely irreducibles are also needed for patterns of factorizations. So if you're to study patterns of factorizations, you need the non-absolutely irreducibles. So there is a, a first example in, in that paper, and there is a notion of factorization schemes in that book, and, but these are mainly in monoids, yeah. So in this integer value polynomials, I think it's only this example in my paper that, that is on patterns to the best of my knowledge, of course. Yeah, so it's a very open area. Almost nothing is done. Okay. Now we go to absolute irreducibility in int D. Okay. Absolute irreducibility in int D. Okay. Okay. We need some preliminary definitions. Okay, so let it be a principal ideal domain, which we shall denote by PID with quotient field K. So likewise, imagine integers with rationals. So a polynomial F is called primitive if the GCD of its coefficients is one. Another thing we need is the standard form. So remember, we said at the beginning that you can write a polynomial in Kx as a quotient g over b. So in this case, we are writing the numerator explicitly by factorizing it. So in that form, a b is non-zero and, and yeah, a b is a non-zero and they're relatively prime. i is a finite set and the g i is a primitive and irreducible in ds. Okay, then we shall call that the standard form. Later on, we shall always refer to the standard form as that. Okay, another definition. Yeah, unfortunately we can't bypass any definition. Okay, so let's G and DX, then the fixed divisor of G, which we denote by DG, is the ideal of D generated by the images GA with A and D. That is, the fixed divisor of G is the GCD of the images. Remember, our D is now a principal ideal domain from now on actually. So we can talk about GCD. So it's the ID generated by the GCD of the images. Okay. For instance, yeah, we have an example. So G, excuse me. So G is equal to that. This is in, in, in ZX. Then the fixed divisor is the ID generated by the GCD of these images. So in principle, what you note is that I'm not taking on elements of Z. In principle, it's supposed to be the GCD of the images for all elements of Z. But ZX and in particular int Z is very special that you don't have to check on elements of Z 
you only check for images from, that, from zero up to the degree of that polynomial. So the degree in this case is three. So it's just a GCD of the images, G naught up to G3. I checked for you, it is six. So in principle, it's an ideal, but in most cases we abuse notation and just write the, the generator. Okay, a quick remark. So such a polynomial in Kx, it's in standard form. Then F is an HD, if and only if B divides, the fixed divisor. Remember before we said, B must divide the images GA. Now the images GA are now represented by the fixed divisor. It's exactly the fixed divisor. Okay. But for irreducibility, we require A to be one. Remember this is in the standard form. So if A is not, is not a unit or if it's not one, then we can always factor root of. So in that case, the polynomial is not irreducible. So we require that A is one and B is exactly the fixed divisor of the numerator. And we call such polynomials image primitive. It's the numerator over its fixed divisor. An example for our polynomials already got the fixed divisor. So such a polynomial this over six is image primitive, numerator over its fixed divisor. So why are we emphasizing that irreducibility requires image primitive? If a polynomial is not image primitive, say this over two, remember the fixed divisor is six, then we can always split off the um, a prime divisor of the fixed divisor. So F is equal to that, is a factorization of F. So if it's not image primitive, we cannot talk of irreducibility. I mean, it's already not irreducible. So later on, all our polynomials will be image primitive. One more definition before we go to the criterion. So let D be a, a PID principal ideal domain and P in D a prime element. Then the PID version of A in D, I'm stopping at D, in general it's supposed to be on K. So A in D is, PID version of A is the maximum N in Z such that P to the power N divides A. And the PID version of zero is infinity. For instance, in Z, the two ID version of A is three from the definition and the two are declaration of 12 is two. Yes. Then the two are declaration of 15 is zero because I mean, 15 is non divisible by two. Okay. We are ready for the criterion. Likewise, we need definitions. And these are very special for this criterion. They, they are very new for this criterion. So let it be a PID. I are finite states, and for I in I, let GI in DX be primitive and irreducible. And let GX be the product of the GIs and pick an element P, which is prime in D. Okay. We say that GI is essential for P. If P divides the fixed device of G, and there exists a W in D, that the periodic valuation of gi at w is greater than zero and the periodic valuation of gj at w is zero for all the other j's not equal to i. So what does it mean? The periodic valuation of gi is positive at only, the periodic valuation at w is positive only at gi. Elsewhere it should be zero. Okay, so we call such a W a witness for GI being essential for P. So in other words, for example, the case we had, okay, I can't take you up to that. So in other words, GI should be the only one playing that role in that numerator. Okay, so we, have, we also have quintessential. So we say that GI is quintessential for P if P divides the fixed device of G and there exists a W in D, such that the periodic valuation of GI at W is exactly the periodic valuation of the fixed divisor. And it is zero elsewhere. So in other words, likewise in this case, we require the periodic valuation to be greater than zero at GI, but it should be exactly the periodic valuation of the fixed divisor. We shall look at an example. Okay, and likewise, we call such a W a witness for GI being quintessential for P. 
So our criterion is based on these two definitions. They are key. So stay at them for a while. An example. So our index set I is just one, two, three. Now as we have three polynomials, G1 is x squared. We are in Zx. So G1 is x squared plus nine. G2 is x minus four. And G3 is x minus five. Then we set Gx to be the product. So then the fifth divisor of G is six. So likewise, it's the GCD. In this case, our yes, our polynomial has degree four. So you pay you you check images, GCD of images, G0, G1, up to G4 using this G. So it's six. I already checked. So what are our prime divisors? We have two and three. Two and three are our prime divisors. So we check which one is essential for two, which one is not essential for two, which one is quintessential and which one is not. So for two, we see that x squared plus nine can cover all, we are starting with essential. So x squared plus nine can cover all the odd integers, but likewise, x minus five can cover all the odd integers. What does it mean? When I do I with, essential is you can't do I with that polynomial. So when I do I with x minus five, still covered by x squared plus nine. And when I do I with x squared plus nine, I am still covered with x minus five. Okay, so what does it mean? G1 and G2, G3 are not essential for two. Whereas G2, when you look at G2, is covering the even numbers. So any even number I pick, I get zero this side, I get zero for x minus five. So I get only a positive toward differentiation at x minus four. What does it mean? G2 is essential for two with witness zero, but any even integer is a witness in that case. Okay, so quintessential, G2 is also quintessential. I mean, if these are not essential, we cannot even talk about quintessential. So these are not quintessential. So G2 is also quintessential. Remember quintessential, we said we must get exactly the two add evaluation of the fixed divisor. So the two add evaluation of six is one. And when we plug into here, we get the two add evaluation exactly one. Okay, we have two prime divisors, two and three. Those which are essential for three, G1 with witness zero. When I plug in zero, this in X minus one, X minus five, I don't get anything. So I get a three, a positive three at evaluation at, at G1. Then likewise, when I plug in W equal to one, witness one, in G2, I don't get anything at G1 and nothing at G3. So I only get a positive one at G2. And likewise, G3 is, is essential with witness two. Okay, so what about quintessential for three? So we see that witness one, now the three are declaration of six is also one. What does it mean? Likewise, when we plug in one here, we get three are declaration one. And when we plug in two in X minus five, we get three are declaration one, implying that G2 and G3 are quintessential for three. So what about G1? G1 is covering 3z or the multiples of three. And we see that any multiple of three you plug in x squared plus nine, you'll get the three add equation greater than or equal to two. Yes, two. So in other words, G1 is not quintessential for three. Okay, so our graphs, um, the graphs depend on these definitions, essential and quintessential. We are ready for the graphs. D is still a PID, principal ideal domain, I is non-empty and finite, and the GIs are primitive and irreducible. So the essential graph of GIs is the simple undirected graph, just a normal graph, yes, without loops. So whose set of vertices is I, and in which i j is an edge, if and only if there exists a prime element p in d, such that both g i and g j are essential for p. So my set of vertices for a graph is i, the index set. Then I can only have an edge i j if there is a prime element p in d, 
such that GI and GJ are essential for that P. Quintessential is defined similarly. So the quintessential graph of GI is the simple undirected graph whose set of vertices is I and in which IJ is an H, even only if there exists a prime element P and D such that both GI and GJ are quintessential for P. So likewise, the, in the set of vertices is I, is the index set, and IJ, we can only have an H IJ if GI and GJ are quintessential for P, for some prime P. Okay, so let's look at the graphs for our previous example. So our previous example, we had those which are essential for two, we had only G2, those which are essential for three, we had G1, G2, and G3. Okay, how does our graph look like? So G2 is just one, so two is not actually participating, but three gives us G1 is essential, G2 is essential, G3 is essential. We have edges from all of these, our graph is that. So this is our essential graph. All the edges are given to us by three because all of them, all the GIs are essential for three. So what about quintessential? Likewise, quintessential we have G2 is quintessential with witness two. It's not helpful, it's just one. So what about three? So G2 is quintessential for three and G3 as well. Now in this case, we have an edge. So how does our quintessential graph look like? It's that. In this case, it's not connected. So the essential one is connected. The quintessential one is not connected because one is nowhere to be seen. G1 is not quintessential for anything. Okay. Now our, our criterion is based on the connectedness of the essential graph and the connectedness of the quintessential graph. It's what we are looking at next. Okay. Okay. So we are finally there. Okay. So F is the name C, not constant and image primitive written in standard form as that. F is, is non-constant and image primitive, written in standard form as that. So if the essential graph G of the GIs is connected, then F is irreducible in entity. In other words, connectedness of the essential graph implies irreducibility in entity. Remember, D is a principal ideal domain. Okay. So I'll give, us, I'll give a sketch of the proof to give you a feeling of the tools. So in this particular case, Okay, so suppose G is connected and say F can be expressed in each D as this. So I'm leaving out some details because one would wonder why shouldn't I have constant? So I'm leaving that out. Okay, so F is equal to that. We're not supposed to have contacts. What contacts? Constants. So F is equal to that. So one reason we're not supposed to have constants, it has to do with F being image primitive, but we won't go into that. So F is equal to that. So what do we do? So we pick I in I1 and J in I. So we are using this. So we pick I in I1 and J in I, I not equal to J, and show that J is in I1, and arbitrarily J, so it's in I1. And what we use is the connectedness of G. So what do we want to do? So we, we pick I here, then we show that any arbitrary element of I is also in I1, in the index set I1. What does that mean? That I1 is actually I, which implies that F is irreducible. So that's what we use, and we are using the connectedness of G. So we pick I and J. Now, because the graph is connected, we have a path from I to J. Okay, so, but remember from the definition of essential graph, connectedness of the essential graph, this edge from I to I1 means that there is a prime element which should be a, a prime divisor of P such that GI and GI1 are essential for that P. So what does it mean? 
I1 is in I, I naught is in index set I1. So that means P has to divide only B1. So in other words, a polynomial, if, it's, if, if a polynomial is essential and it's not in any of these index, I mean, in, among these other polynomials, then P cannot divide V2 up to Bm because the polynomial was essential. You can't do away with it in other words. Okay. Now P <laughs> must divide B1, but also I1, little I1 was essential, is essential by definition for P. That means I1 must also be in the index set I1 because P is dividing B1. Okay, what about the next edge? So the next edge means the same thing, that there is a prime. It should, it could be actually this, other, this prime, the same prime, such that GI1 and GI2 are both essential for that prime. So for that particular prime, I1 is already in, I in, in index set I1. What does it mean? Still that P can only divide B1. And because I2 is also essential, it has to go to I1. Now, so J finds itself in I1, which implies that I1 is I. Okay. So likewise, connectedness of the quintessential graph implies absolute irreducibility. Connectedness of the quintessential graph implies absolute irreducibility. Okay. An example. Using this theorem, we see that X choose P is absolutely irreducible. Why? Because the PR differential of P factorial is exactly one. So X is quintessential for P with witness X my, with witness P. X minus one is quintessential for P with witness P plus one and so on. So we get a connected graph by P. Okay, so X choose P, we can't get more because one would wonder what about N, we can't get more. But it's also known, this is very recent, it's still on the archive. So for any arbitrary N, X choose N is absolutely irreducible. Okay, so the converse of both theorems don't hold. The converse doesn't hold. The converse of the quintessential graph does not hold. Why? Because this is absolutely irreducible in int C, but this is its graph. X and X, can, I mean, they are playing the same role, so none of them is essential. This is quintessential. In other words, they're not quintessential. This is essential, quintessential, but it's not helpful to give us an edge. Okay. But the converse holds in the, gen, in the, in the square free environment, yes. So when the denominator is square free, if this is just a two, then the converse holds. In particular, F in D, non-constant and image primitive, with, with square free denominator, the P's are distinct, retaining standard form as that, then F is absolutely irreducible if and only if the quintessential graph is connected. Okay, so, so the proof of this, I'll leave it out. <clears throat> But maybe what I have to note that in this proof, in this proof, we get a bound that if F that we have, we, we explicitly find a factorization of F in case F is not absolutely irreducible. So F cubed is equal to that, but I didn't explain that. So, but maybe what I want to comment about this is that in this case of square free, sorry, in this case of square free denominators, we have a bound. In other words, we have a corollary. Sorry about that. That D, if D is a PID, F in HD, non constant and image primitive with square free denominator, and F cubed, once F cubed has a unique factorization in HD, then F is absolutely irreducible. So this is in the square free environment. So I can already see that an element is not absolutely irreducible at F cubed. So at F cubed, once I have a unique factorization, then that element is absolutely irreducible. Okay. 
So an application, not an application, it's an example of a previous theorem. So we had our example like that, essential graph and quintessential graph. This polynomial with fixed divisor six. So the connected, so our polynomial is this. Remember I said it's the numerator over the fixed divisor. So if the graph, because the graph is connected, the essential graph is connected, this polynomial is irreducible in int six. But the quintessential graph is not connected and, and we are in the square free environment denominator, then F is not absolutely irreducible by the previous theorem. Okay. Now these are some of the references. This is the general reference. The first one is the general reference for integer valid polynomials. The second one, is where one can find the characterization of absolutely irreducible elements in rings of integers of number fields. Then the third one is the general reference for factorization theory. And the fourth one is where um, the concept of absolute irreducibility started from. Yes. Okay. Then these two are the polynomials for sets of polynomials. These two are the references for sets of lengths. This is the, the first one is for Professor Fish and this is our, ours. Then boom, these are for absolute irreducibility. So number seven is where the graph theoretic criterion is. Thank you so much for your attention. Mm -hmm.